Um, I thought that as an introductory speaker uh, for the day, I may actually uh, spend some time just providing a definition of an object uh, so that we might share some vocabulary, or if we don't share the vocabulary, we might at least uh, disagree uh, on it and come to an understanding of what we mean by capital. So today, uh, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to provide a kind of just a basic definition of my understanding of capital, which uh, draws a little bit on uh, what Mike just outlined in the work of Pierre Bourdieu um, and a little bit of the work of others. Uh, I'm going to use that then to make sense of how it is that we've thought about cultural capital and issue a kind of challenge to the understanding of cultural capital. Um, and uh, then uh, relate that to some of the patterns of inequality that have happened in the Uni uh, United States and in Europe um, to a lesser degree in, in other places around the globe uh, over the last 40 years, and then conclude by considering at least lightly what some of the implications of this might be um, for the concept of uh, science capital or scientific capital, um, which is an area I know less about, so I plan to speak a little bit less about it. Um, so what is capital? How is it that we might understand it? Um, well, uh, I'm just going to use another word to define it, which is to define it as a resource um, that might have both an amount and a trajectory. And by an amount, I simply mean that uh, you can have more or less of it. Uh, so it's something that you can quantify uh, in some way um, and consider what its uh, overall uh, value is. And by a trajectory, I mean that like most resources, we might think of it uh, as having an investment value. And by an investment value, I mean that it anticipates the future. Uh, so that uh, in, insofar as one invests in a kind of resource or uh, develops a sort of resource, there's an anticipatory uh, aspect to that, which means that you, you, you think uh, by purchasing or by investing in this particular resource, um, it may have value in the future. And those investments are either wise or costly. Um, that is, you either do well with them or you don't do so well with them. Um, most of us should be somewhat familiar with this, hopefully more familiar with one aspect than the other. Now, when we think about the value, both the, uh, the amount of scientific capital or any kind of capital, um, I'm going to argue that those amounts are defined socially rather than by necessity. And let me just give a kind of example here. And it'll be a very American example. Um, so my Americanness will show, show through. Um, but you could, you could ask uh, about two people who have two kinds of human capital. That is, uh, they have skills. And one is the greatest jump roper in the world. That is, they are the greatest person in the world at skipping rope. Um, and then the other is the greatest jump shooter in the world. That is, they are the greatest person in the world at uh, uh, throwing a ball into the air and making it fall into a little hoop. Um, and both of these are modes of human capital. That is, they're real skills that people would have to work to develop. And we might imagine a diversity or a capacity of different people to develop those skills. Um, but in one instance, that is, if I'm the jump, greatest jump roper in the world, it's a rather useless skill. Um, and in another instance, if I'm the greatest jump shooter in the world, I may become fantastically wealthy. Um, and when we think about this for a moment, when we think about the difference of these two things, it would be difficult to argue in this context um, that there's some inherent greater use uh, value to the quality of being a great jump shooter. Instead, the usefulness of being the greatest jump shooter in the world is tied up with or enmeshed with a set of historical contingencies um, that made it so. And this is a long-winded way of saying that the use value or the, um, the value of a particular form of capital is socially defined, um, often defined by the conglomeration uh, or the web of interrelations within which uh, uh, that form of capital is enmeshed and not an inherent quality of the capital itself. Um, However, uh, it's not defined r freely. Um, so uh, we can think of, and this will relate to some inequality points I'll come to later, uh, ways in which I might do things to make the sets of skills I develop more valuable. So there isn't simply one mode of capital in the world. There are multiple modes of capitals in the world. And people have the capacity to deploy those capitals to advantage the other kinds of capital that they have. Uh, another way of thinking about this is that if different people make different investments in their modes of capital, the amount of other kinds of capital that they have matter for the likely outcome of that investment. In other words, you don't have a kind of market of investment where the best investment wins, but instead 
other resources can be deployed to increase the value of the particular conglomeration of resources that one person might have or one group of people might have. Finally, um, I want to suggest that different kinds of capital have exchange values with one another. Um, and here we might just think about this relative to currency markets. So uh, that if I, uh, uh, I just came from the United States, uh, the dollar is very weak against the pound. And so uh, every time I buy something here in London, I think, whew, that's expensive. Um, but we could think of other resources as having this quality. And while today we exist in a world where economic capital is rather dominant, it's not always the case that it was completely dominant. Um, there would be other moments in times where status or honor, social connections may have been slightly more valuable. And so understanding the relationship between or the exchange values between these resources is incredibly important for uh, making sense of how it is that capital works um, uh, within the world. This is then a sort of foundational way in which we might begin to think of capital and then place uh, the idea of scientific capital within uh, this overall con context. I want to turn now to cultural capital and to the ways in which we've understood cultural capital. And I'm going to make two points about cultural capital. The first is the ways in which uh, we, uh, the Bourdieuian understanding of cultural capital I'm going to um, uh, challenge a little bit. And then I'm going to make an argument about how it is that um, uh, what I'll call sort of theory methods packages helped make cultural capital a more important concept. Um, if we combine the two points that I made above uh, about uh, the social contingency and the exchange value of capital, uh, we realize something quite important about uh, resources, um, which is that while resources may have an amount, that amount is defined socially. And uh, the monetary uh, analogy I've used in this context can be rather misleading, actually. And this is the analogy that we typically deploy when thinking about uh, capital, the monetary analogy. Um, uh, but there's an important caveat to this. So um, as an example, I may pull out, uh, uh, how much is it? Five pounds, right? So imagine for a moment that I have five pounds, and I want to go and buy things on a market. Um, and so I leave here, and I'm not able to get much, um, but I'm able to get something for my, for my five pounds. Um, and you also have five pounds. That is, you have a similar amount of money, and you walk outside, and you go into markets, and you try to buy things. The first thing we realize when we think about mon money in this way is that it's rather ambivalent to the person who, can, who holds it. Um, in fact, it should be almost completely ambivalent. Now, this is not strictly the case. We have evidence of the ways in which um, different situated people will pay different amounts for objects. In the United States, one of the classic examples of this is cars. Women pay more for cars than men do, um, even though they're the same object, because cars have inflated prices. You're expected to bargain. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's a dynamic to the bargaining, both in terms of whether or not car salesmen respect women's bargaining and whether or not women are willing to bargain, which means that the, the price of the car value varies by the person. But in general, this is a very weird uh, way in which a market works. In most instances, when I walk into a store, let's say to buy a coffee, the coffee costs the same for me as it does for you. However, capital doesn't quite work this way. Um, uh, cultural capital or other modes of capital in the world. Um, and uh, that is that in most instances, the expression and payment or, or uh, use of capital is highly contingent upon the person who's actually deploying it. And this becomes uh, an uh, important part when thinking about the relationship between capital and inequality. So if I have 20 units of cultural capital and you have 20 units of cultural capital, um, I may actually have an overvalued quality to my cultural capital and you a comparatively undervalued quality to your cultural capital, even if we have the same material amount, particularly in terms of how it's measured. So here we might look at Bourdieu for a moment and ask how is it in distinction that Mike pointed out at the beginning, Bourdieu measures cultural capital. And what he does is he does a survey of people and he asks them, who wrote the concerto for the left hand? Um, and as it turns out, lots of people, see, so I have lots of cultural capital, but Bourdieu is French, so the, the answer that he was looking for was Ravel. Um, and then it asks, what kinds of classical musicians uh, or classical composers do you like? If you responded, I like the Blue Danube of Strauss, eh, you're not so high on the cultural capital spectrum. If you said to yourself, I really, really love uh, the well-tempered clavier, 
There you go. You're like, you're solid. Um, you've, got, you've got high amounts. And then you could just basically look at people, measure how much they have, and see to compare them one, one to one. But imagine for a moment uh, that a black Caribbean person and an East Asian person both have the same amount, that is the measured amount, of cultural capital. And, uh, and they do particularly around the issue of classical music. So they know the exact same amount, and they have a similar conglomeration of tastes. I would be somewhat surprised if the reception of the black Caribbean person's knowledge of classical music was the same as the East Asian person's. We might do another analogy here. Imagine for a moment that you have two people, a woman and a man, and they know the same amount about sports. I would be somewhat surprised if the woman's knowledge about athletics was respected in the same way as the man's. In this sense, then, we should, playing off the idea, uh, an idea of Foucault's, we might think of capital as a practice and not a possession. Um, that is, cultural capital is not something people have, it's something that they do. And as something that they do, it's highly contingent upon its reception by others within an interaction. So it's not simply the amount of cultural capital that you have, but it's whether or not in attempting to spend it, that is, in attempting to put that five pounds on the table, the person actually looks at the currency, looks at you, and says, I'll agree to that. And here, um, we might then begin to think of the ways in which capital is a kind of practice. And this will have some implications, I think, for scientific capital. Some of this also has implications for inequality. So uh, um, I suspect this was something that um, uh, I was anticipated to talk about a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit lighter here. And I'll simply point out that it's not the quality of the culture that matters, but it's its interrelations and situated practices. In English, what that means is that the definition of cultural capital is socially determined and not defined by the inherent qualities of the objects themselves. And uh, as such, it's highly contingent upon its relationship to other modes of capital. Second, uh, we can think of cultural capital as something that is both produced by and produces modes of inequality. It's not a simple unidirectional relationship. Uh, other uh, resources can be used to define and augment cultural inequalities. And vice versa, cultural capital can be used to hope both define and augment other modes of capital. So economic capital can be used to purchase cultural capital. Parents who send their children to have piano lessons do exactly this. That is, they use economic markets to purchase cultural rewards. And cultural capital can be used to pr produce or to purchase economic rewards. In this sense, we then might not think of capital as independent things, but, uh, but as existing within webs of mutually constitutive systems. Um, they're not independent factors. Finally, the reception of uh, modes of capital uh, is conditioned upon the webs of interrelations within which the capitals themselves are operated and within that kind of situation. Um, this is a long, uh, maybe a, a somewhat abstract way of saying that when we begin to think of scientific capital and we begin to deploy uh, it as a kind of concept, we might do uh, some of the things that uh, theoretically Bourdieu suggests we do, but in practice he rarely does, which is to think about the ways how scientific capital is not just a resource that has an amount that people acquire, but instead is enmeshed within a web of mutually constitutive systems um, that seek to transform and augment it. Finally, I'll conclude uh, on the implications uh, for scientific capital. I want to have one, just for the sort of academics in the room, uh, theory methods package argument before uh, just ending with a series of questions. We might ask how it was that cultural capital became particularly prominent as a concept. And here I know much more about the American intellectual history than I do uh, the European, so I'll just use the American intellectual history. Paul DiMaggio, uh, a sociologist at Princeton University, made cultural capital quite prominent. And how did he do it? Basically by constructing a kind of theory methods package. Um, and by theory methods package, I meant that at the time, there were modes of social inquiry that were particularly interested in quantification um, of a particular kind. Uh, so uh, measuring things that could be placed into regression functions. And cultural capital then became also a kind of concept that allowed us to bring culture in to what were otherwise heavily economistic and uh, occupational modes of understanding. So it became something you could clearly measure, place within a method that was available, and therefore look at its effect in the world. 
I don't think that this was wrong, but I think it's interesting to, to consider the ways in which concepts become dominant is not just by the value of the concept itself, but how it interrelates with others. Um, in terms of questions that I would ask then about uh, scientific capital, I might ask, what is the trajectory of scientific capital? Um, and uh, what if we understand sci scientific capital as something that's defined socially rather than scholastically or through the quality of science itself? You might think about the interrelationship between capitalism and science here and that the value of scientific capital is not necessarily simply in the value of scientific knowledge itself, but in the transformations of economic systems that make particular modes of scientific knowledge more valuable. In that sense, it isn't science that is driving the rise of scientific capital. It may, in fact, be particular modes modes uh, of capitalism. Uh, for, third, uh, how does scientific capital struggle with other forms of capital? So if we think of scientific capital as enmeshed within a web of interrelations of other modes of capital, uh, what is the struggle, to use a kind of Bourdieuian term, that scientific capital has with other modes of capital, and how does it help constitute them? What does it mean to think of scientific capital not as something that individuals have or that you develop as a capacity of a person, but instead as something that they do and whose doing is received and accepted by others? Um, and those others may well have commitments to the value of other kinds of capital. So what if we begin to transform our understanding of scientific capital as we need young people to learn things about science and we begin to consider the ways in which science is a kind of practice enmeshed within other kinds of social relationships. Um, to shift my uh, sports analogy, how respected, for example, is women's expressions of scientific knowledge in comparisons to men? We might think about this racially. And so then we might ask, how can we think of scientific capital as part of a web of mutually constituting systems rather than an additional or independent force that we might consider? If science is a resource, who is it a resource for and to what end? I'll end there. Thank you.